Okay, I'll watch my time now because I don't want to talk for too long. I know that people have places to go and other things to do as well. Um, uh, I'm not quite sure which one I should start with first. I think perhaps I will start with uh, a little bit out of the, a glass full of letters. And I should say in a way what's quite amazing about this is I recently took it up again to look at it simply because of it being translated into Tamil and I had to look at it. And I was astonished to find that it was actually a historical novel although it's set in the 1980s, because the amount of research you would have to do now to try and imagine yourself into a place where there were no mobile phones and nothing at all like, and, and nothing at all, and also that letters were written. Because when this book was set, in fact, when I was writing it, nobody did emails. Faxes were new. Um, so it is amazing, like you would, you would really have a lot of work to do to, 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 to get back to this now. So I stand here still alive, having written a historical novel. <laughs> um, and I should also say, so one of the things that will happen with email and all the rest of the technology we have now is not just the death of letters, which is a terrible thing, but the death of the epistolary novel perhaps will go. Um, because it will it'll, it'll leave people's minds as a way. And it's a very handy thing, the notion of every second chapter in this, in this novel is in letter form. And it's an extraordinarily handy thing in order to have people argue things out. And for instance, this is a bit that I will read you now. At that particular time, it was very difficult to discuss the north of Ireland in Ireland. Um, uh, section 31, which I don't know if many of you will know about, which was the censorship on radio, on television. On, um, um, you couldn't interview anybody from the provisional IRA. Um, and there were two sides to that debate. One who said that you, you, if you didn't talk to them, then they'd stop, they'd go away. And the other that said if you didn't talk to them, you didn't put them on the spot, and therefore you didn't know what they were about. Well, actually, there was a third side which said you should talk to them anyway because it's free speech. But what I did in this, and you couldn't say, you couldn't stand up and say, I want them to be interviewed without being accused of being that brilliant word, a fellow traveler. So in this book, what I did was is I set up letters. So therefore, one can argue the debate out because they can fall out over it by letter. So actually, I'll just read you a little bit now that I've started talking about that. I'll just say this. One man goes to America in this, in the 1980s, and he rents out his house to three renegades, feminists and anarchists and people like that. And one of them is visiting a person in prison and convinces some of the other people to do so, and therefore that's how these two most unlikely people begin to visit somebody in prison. Just a short note, Connie. This is from the man Fergal, who's in America. I must say, I find this newfound interest in prisoners' conditions a little irritating. I would never have seen either you or Bernard as amnesty types. Forgive me, my annoyance probably comes from feeling so left out. Of course, I'm interested in history, I always have been. With regards to the Northern question, I have kept myself informed of every new twist in our tale. In discussions, I have always prevaricated wisely because I don't want to take sides. It is a far too difficult matter. I am therefore terribly surprised that you and Bernard, whom I wasn't aware of being in any way interest, should take sides so quickly. I've tried to put this as kindly as possible, but really I am concerned, Fergal. Dear Fergal, I was surprised to get your card this morning. Firstly, I felt it petty of you not to refer to my Italian holiday and my letter describing it. <laughs> Secondly, you sounded as if it's all right for you to take political decisions or wrong decisions because you've read your quota of history books, but not me. Isn't that a little patronising? And anyway, a letter is hardly taking sides. Also, Fergal, how can you presume to know what my opinions are or have been? I have not always lived in the same street or indeed the same city or country as you. I hope this, this does not sound too harsh, Connie. 
Dear Helena from Fergal, now it appears I've put my foot in it with Connie. It's always been the same. The bloody North breaks up friendships all over the place. Connie says she's not taking sides, but really, writing to a provo is hardly sitting on the fence. Quite frankly, I feel like throwing those tenants out, but I'm afraid of upsetting Bernard and Connie. What do you think? And please don't tell me that you think it's all going to be okay. Then here's one from the prisoner, because Connie decides to visit him eventually, but then doesn't turn up. Dear Connie, thank you for your note. I was very disappointed that you didn't turn up, and I must admit, not just a little angry, because someone else might have come to see me. Visits are not very easily organised, you know. I don't think you've been honest with yourself. I think you just couldn't make the leap to being a person who had visited a jail. Not an unusual problem, I must admit. I think you see me as a prisoner, not as a person. And indeed, that is what I am for the moment. Of course, after I get out, I'll be an ex-prisoner to some people. But to myself, both now and in the future, I am and always will be Senan Lillis. P.S. There is another thing that will surprise you. This war will not go on forever. And when it stops, I and the like of me will have to be forgiven. And I will have to forgive those who took the lives of my friends and those who took all those years away from me and those who still will not forgive me. And the thing that annoys me is that the rewriters will be crawling all over the place within a week of the treaty and we will have to let them waffle to their heart's content, piling lie upon lie. Oh, the joys of having made martyrs out of ourselves. Uh, there might be one more along the theme of that. Dear Helena, this is from Fergal, who is getting very exercised altogether in New York. I have just got a letter from Connie. I'm amazed at how blasé she is about corresponding with a provo. She even tried to implicate me by asking me to get books for him. I will, in my arse, browse around New York looking for books for a provo. She was complaining that his letters were censored. Has she gone off her head altogether? What does she expect? Of course they're censored. The authorities need to know what these people are thinking. She writes as if it were normal behaviour to be communicating with paramilitaries. I don't know. I wish I was there. Of course, if I hadn't left, this would never have happened. Enough of that. When are you coming back on the New York route? Um, I'll just, it's funny, I had mentioned that I was going to speak about men and letters. Because in fact, if you look at Australian history, a lot of men did write because a lot of men came on their own first and they did write. But what, what I think happened is, is that men, men got onto the technologies, I think, much quicker and stopped writing letters, I think, much quicker. But this is one that will just tell you the history. It's a very short letter. Dear Connie, something struck me the other day. In the houses that I visit... It is the women who get the telephone messages all the time. Your uncle is dead. Ring your mother. Your sister has had a baby girl. Ring home. Your brother has got engaged to Mary. Ring Catherine immediately. We never get any messages. So ring me sometime and leave a message. Love, <laughs> Virgo. But of course, there'd be none of that now. None of that now. Uh, I might read you one more little bit from this um, uh, before I go on to the story called The Meaning of Missing. Um, what I wanted to do in this book was to have somebody to leave Ireland and therefore have a completely outside view. But at the same time, and I was going to read you a piece which is about longing, but I think I'd leave that. Um, he doesn't want to leave. There's a great difference in deciding to leave somewhere for adventure or for, reason, for, for, for reasons that can be good. But he doesn't particularly want to leave, but it's absolutely necessary that he does uh, uh, for work. So he is writing back. 
But as well as that, I wanted somebody who came in and out of Ireland, who is both inside and outside. So I had what we used to call aerostesses, who are now stewards, I think. Um, so there's an air hostess in this story. And actually, the air hostess is the narrator, because she both comes in and goes out. Um, so as well as it being a way to discuss I think what the book was about was discussing everything that was happening in Ireland precisely at that time, but was using letter form in order to do it. And accidentally, I happened to be at the end of a thing in which letters were then disappearing because emails were, were happening so soon afterwards. But I'll just read you a little bit about the narrator. Um, uh, when I was 26, I met my husband, although I didn't know then that that was what he was. I lived in a constantly warm house in Swords, constantly warm because we four, all air hostesses, did different shifts. So we boiled kettles and lit fires back to back. It was a well-watched house too by neighbours who seemed like aliens to us, people with marriages and cars and children. Kevin asked a friend of his who was going out with Betty of the Italian route if he thought he'd have a chance asking me for a date. The friend, a boisterous man with a tinny laugh, told us this as a joke, and I got so annoyed at that that I found Kevin's number and asked him myself. <laughs> Kevin was nervous, and I simply couldn't understand why. I had no interest in him. He's not nervous now. I kept saying yes to his requests for dates for reasons which were nothing to do with wanting to go out with him. I didn't know what the reasons were. When I met him with friends of his, he wasn't nervous at all. He was rather sprightly and confident, actually. The whole thing puzzled me. When people describe, or when I read of falling in love, it still perplexes me. That's not what happened to us. Well, to me, anyway. Maybe it did happen to Kevin, and that's why he was nervous. I would notice that when we were walking together, he would skip to get in step with me, or shuffle to get our feet hitting the ground in tandem, presuming I wouldn't notice. I quite honestly thought it was crackers. <laughs> but we got engaged. And after the engagement party, Kevin and I went to bed together. Now, I hadn't much experience, much to compare. We didn't in those days. But I knew a good thing when I saw it, even if I didn't know what it was. <laughs> he was simply unbelievable. I wouldn't have expected it to look at him. It's funny how stupid we are. We really do believe the ads. We think the good lookers, the suave ones, are the ones who are good in bed. Maybe it is partly true that one needs a little confidence to start kissing and to dare a panoramic lovemaking, but only partly and only sometimes and often absolutely not, because the handsome are too interested in themselves. <laughs> and really, we shouldn't have fallen for that guff. Good lovemaking couldn't have been invented in the 70s, the 80s, the 50s, the 20s. Some people have always been able to do it properly, as if it mattered. And those people have not always looked the way we imagined. Kevin didn't look like Kevin the lover. He and I curled up into a place that became time, that became our wedding. We were almost unaware of our guests. I don't remember much about our first few months, just an overall sense of warmth, a touch of cystitis that seemed worth it, and some songs. <laughs> I governed our house searching. I shifted it to the streets beside nurseries and schools. It was just as well that I was pregnant. All the houses seemed to boast of being near schools. That sort of advertising could force one into getting pregnant so as not to waste the amenities. <laughs> so the airline allows her off to work on the ground because she's pregnant. Airlines are kind to women who are expecting. Oh, I love that word, expecting. In the last months, my dreams were too weird even for dreamland. Giving birth to horses' heads, and once, with my mother present, giving birth to my toilet travel bag. 
I can still hear her screaming, it's a bag. <laughs> My day came. With luck, most of us will die with less pain. And that is all I have to say on the matter. <laughs> and it is not true that it is forgotten. It is simply misfiled for the sake of the human race. And it lies there below the skin surface of women who sometimes look at each other across crowded rooms and buses and airports and galleries and say nothing. Okay, so that's from that bit. <laughs> So, obviously, you can get a lot as well with, you know, or there's a, there's a lot going on, I think, more than just the politics of what was going on, but there you go, that's it. Now, <clears throat> now what I'm going to do is I'm going to read this story here, which is called The Meaning of Missing, and I suppose in a way, um, it's from the point of view that often, particularly, I think, in, in, in communities where people have emigrated too. Emigration is talked about in a certain way, but I'm always very aware of the fact that there are lots of people who don't emigrate who would actually quite like to. Although I do know the opposite to be true, because I know that I have a son whom I continuously sort of say, well, you know, if you went there, and eventually he said to me, by the way, I don't want to go there. I don't, it's you that wants to go there. <laughs> And I realized he was right. He was quite young, but I realized he was right that actually my notion of the continuous travel, and of course Irish people do that a lot. My mother was the oldest of a family of 11 and my father the oldest of a family of 12. And half of both of their families emigrated, mostly to America. Uh, nobody came to Australia. When I came to Australia, I was the first. Um, America, Canada, London, uh, and Belfast. We considered that <laughs> very far away. Um, uh, so we, we were very, and, and, and because of the position of my parents in their families, their, their brothers and sisters brought home their children to us continuously, and we had a farm in County Monaghan. So by the time I was 17, I knew more New Yorkers than I did Dubliners because there was this continuous stream of people coming in and out. And it's interesting, I'm just doing a little bit of work at the moment on Grace Paley, who's a Jewish New York short story writer. I'm doing an essay. And uh, I, 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 I remembered that thing about knowing so many New Yorkers before I knew anybody else. Certainly I knew no one from Cork <laughs> or Mayo. You know, that sort of thing. It's quite amazing that I would have known so many New Yorkers. But anyway, there we go. This is another story, and I don't know what it's about. It's a few things. But what's interesting is it was published here. Oh, some of you may know this story. I don't know, will you bear me reading it? If, if it's called The Meaning of Missing. It was in Chinton. You'll have to bear me reading it, if, if, even if you know it. We'll see how we go. But somebody who, who, who read this story here took a completely different meaning than what I thought it was about. So you're not always sure what a thing is about. The meaning of missing. I think of the feeling around a person being missing as being a narrow thing. It has to be in order to get into so many places. I told my husband this once and he laughed at me. Well, if you can think of heartbreak as a thin, piercing agony, I began again. He said that the turnips needed thinning and he was away out to the garden. He didn't like talking about heartbreak because he had once caused it to me by going off with his ex-girlfriend for three months. It didn't work out because he turned up on my doorstep on Thursday, the 6th of June, 20 years ago, at 10 past 8 in the evening. He wasn't contrite, he was just chastened. He has been here since, but he has never mentioned it. I don't mind too much because I never admitted that I had cried crossing every bridge in Dublin. The only way to get to know a city, I was told by someone who was clearly trying to get me away from her doorstep. Sinning turnips, ha! You'd think we had an acre out the back and that he was going to have to tie old hot water bottles around his knees because the time on the ground was going to be so hard on them. 
we have one drill of turnips, a half of cabbage and a half of broad beans. Although it's not strictly an economical use of the space, I insist on the broad beans because of the feel of the fur inside them. And it's also about my sister. She's not missing, my husband insisted. You've just not heard from her. I often replay my conversations with him as if he is standing right beside me. I bet I'll be able to do that if he dies before me. For a year. Yes, for a year. But you know how time goes when you're away. I don't actually. I've never been away for a year. When my sister said she was going to Australia, there was a moment's silence between us during which time a little lump came out of my heart and thumped its way into my stomach. We were having our second glass of Heineken. In deference to the scared part of our youth when we were afraid to be too adventurous, she always drank Heineken when out with me. She didn't want to hold the predictability of my life up to the light. I know that she had gone through 10 different favorite drinks since those days and none of them were Heineken. Australia, I squealed, and then I coughed my voice down. Australia, I said, a second time, in a more harmonious tone. It's strange how the same word can mean two different things when the pitch is changed. Berla as Chinese, you might say. <laughs> I must have hit the right note because she smiled and said yes. Not only was she going, she had everything ready. Tickets bought, visa got. It was the secret preparation that rankled most. How could she have done those things without telling me? If we were going to Waterford for a winter break, I'd tell her weeks in advance. <laughs> the day she left was beautifully frosty. She stayed with us the night before, and after I had gone to bed, I could hear her and my husband for hours mumbling and laughing. She was too excited to sleep, and he decided to get in on the act not often having an excited woman to lead him into the small hours. <laughs> the morning radio news said that if there was an earthquake in the Canaries, Ireland might have only two hours to prepare for a tsunami. Brilliant. <laughs> Another thing to worry about. <laughs> and us just after buying a house in Skerries. <laughs> At the airport, my emotions spluttered and faded and then surged again like a fire of Polish coal. The effort of not crying stiffened my face, yet it twitched as if palsy had come into every square inch of it. I would keep my dignity, even if the effort was going to paralyze me. It would be an essential thing to have now. In the months that followed, I mourned her in places that I had never noticed before and in moods that I had not known existed. First, there is presence and then it has to grow into absence. There are all sorts of way, ways for it to do that, gently, unnoticeably, becoming a quiet, rounded cloud that complements the sun with its dashing about, or the other way, darkly, with thunder. It's not as if you saw her all the time, my husband said, unhelpfully. I did, I said. What are you talking about? You only met every few months, but she was there. She wrote well, often referring to the minutia of her journey over, but no matter how often she talked about cramped legs or the heat in Singapore, and despite the fact that I'd seen her off at the airport myself, I still imagined her queuing for a ship at Southampton, sailing the seas for a month, having dinner in pre-arranged settings, because that's the way I would have done it. And then she stopped writing. My letters went unanswered. And still my husband insisted that there was nothing wrong with her, just absent-mindedness. I was in bed sick the day she rang. I loved the trimmings of being sick, mainly the television at the bottom of the bed. Although after two days, I was getting a little TV'd out. I had just seen John Stalker, a former chief of English police, advertising garden awnings. I was puzzled as to why they gave his full title. Did the police thing have anything to do with awnings? I didn't like being confused by advertisements. If I'd had a remote control, I could have switched the volume down occasionally and lip-read 
the modern world. Then countdown came on. Making up the words made me feel useful. I had seen the mathematician wearing that dress before. It was during the conundrum that the phone rang. It wasn't a crucial conundrum because one of the fellows was streets ahead of the other. Even I had him beaten hands down and I had a temperature of 100 degrees and rising. <laughs> Hello. There was her voice, brazen as all hell. I straightened myself against the headboard and thought, it's the temperature. My heart thumped very hard. It sounded like someone rapping a door. I was afraid it would cut off my breathing. Hi, she said. Hello, I said, as best as I could. Oh my God, it's been so long, she said. The sentence sounded ridiculous. And I'm really sorry about that, but I'll make up for it. I'm on my way back for a couple of months. I'll be arriving on Saturday morning. Back, not home. Well, Saturday didn't suit me, and even if it had up until this moment, it certainly wasn't going to now. <laughs> I was speechless, but my mind was working overtime, dealing with the silent words that were tumbling about. I could almost hear them cranking up, scurrying around, looking for their place in the open. What would be the best way to get revenge? She must have finally noticed because she said, are you there? Oh yes, I said, short as that, oh yes. I don't think I said more than 10 words before limping to a satisfactorily oblique fade out. See you then. I put the phone down, my hand shaking. How many people had I told about my worry? And would I have to tell them now that she was no longer missing? If a person turns up, have they ever been missing? How could I possibly remember what conversations I had deliberately set up or slipped into casually over the past year? I hoped that my sister would have a horrible flight, but that's as far as my bile could flower. My husband went to the airport. He would, having no sense of the insult of missing. <laughs> he fitted the journey in around the bits and pieces of a Saturday, not wanting to leave the house under the glare of my disapproval. By evening, I had mellowed a little because I had to. It was seeing her, the shape of her, the stance of her at doorways, the expressions of her. On the third evening, by the time the ice in my chest had begun to melt, the three of us went out to our local. What's Wollongong like? I asked. Just a normal Australian town, she shrugged, and then she changed the subject. I had thought it would have jacaranda trees in bloom all year, sun flitting continuously on the sparkling windows of every house a town rampant with light. I had thought it a place for rumination, with colour bouncing unforgettably off the congregation of gum trees. Are you sure it's just a normal town? Have you been there? Yes, she said, it's totally normal. Of course I've been there. I didn't believe her for one second. Why do you particularly want to know what Wollongong is like? The name, my husband said, as if he was my ventriloquist. But something in my demeanour made him hesitate, and he looked at me as if he had made some mistake. It's just that I met someone from there, I said. When, they both asked. Normally, my sister and my husband have a murmuring familiarity between them, born presumptuously of their relationship with me. But they were both suddenly quiet, each afraid to admit that they did not know when I, I of the dried up life, would have met someone from Wollongong. Damn, they would be thinking, now they each knew that the other didn't know. And me sitting there smiling away to myself, smug they would have been surviving. But it wasn't smug. I admit to a moment of glee, but I was mostly thinking of Wollongong, and I swallowed the sliver of triumph because I am known for my capacity to forgive. However, I didn't answer their question, and I went to the bar to buy my round, feeling like a racehorse, unexpectedly out in front, showing the rest of the field a clear set of hooves. 
There we go. That's it.